as PBS special. <clears throat> what I'm going to do here is um, give a talk for, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, and then we're going to do a satsang, and then we'll do a double satsang the next time we come. Um, what's going to happen, I have no idea. <laughs> but I, I want to share with you uh, something I had told you up in the first met the first day that happened to me. So let me start with this wonderful poem from uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And, and when, I, when I say this poem, um, I would like you to uh, think of it as, uh, ask yourself whether or not you think what I'm saying, what the poet is saying, is, is possible. based upon where you are today and how you've been raised, what you've been raised to believe in. It's, it goes like this. You've probably heard it. He says, what if you slept? And what if in your sleep you dreamed? And what if in your dream you went to heaven? And there picked a strange and wonderful flower. And what if, when you awoke, you held that flower in your hand? Ah, what then? Asked the poet. You think that's possible? To bring something from a dream state to the physical world that your senses tell you is your reality. The fact is that everything that you see is, uh, came from that state. In the Tao Te Ching, in the 40th verse of the Tao, it says that uh, all being originates in non-being. All being comes from non-being. And even quantum physics is teaching us this important lesson. We're beginning to discover that uh, particles themselves do not create more particles. That a particle comes from something called energy, which has no form. So that everything that shows up in the physical world comes from a formless state. Jesus said it. It's the spirit that gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. I find that so fascinating because um, so often in the world of Christianity, especially in the far right edges of it, um, <clears throat> where, it's, uh, where Jesus refers over and over again to it is only through me that you will come to know the Father. Um, but every time they use the word me, or it's capitalized in the, uh, in the New Testament. Right after he says the flesh counts for nothing, so you have to assume he meant his own as well. So that he wasn't talking about his flesh. He wasn't talking about me. He was talking about the spirit that was him. And it is only through this spirit that I and the Father are one. So he was speaking as God, the God that we are all. I have said you are gods. That's from Jesus. So that's just big, one great big miscalculation, it seems to me, <laughs> that we believe it was this man and his flesh who was, uh, who was speaking to us. And he wasn't. He was speaking from another place. <clears throat> So this idea of bringing something from a dream state to a physical state is a very powerful idea. Um, when I tell you that my mother came to visit me um, in Scotland uh, four or five weeks after she passed away, I'm not saying that she was just there in a dream. She was there. And many people have had that experience that I've talked to have had someone show up. In fact, uh, I was having dinner uh, in London with Brian Weiss, many lives
as many masters and all of his work on past life regression. And his wife, Carol, was sitting next to me at the dinner table. And she talked about when her father passed away. Um, back in, I don't remember the year, in the 1960s. And, and he came to her after he had passed away and, and talked to her. And she didn't even tell Brian that after for 12 years, I think it was, uh, because she just didn't want him to think she was crazy, <laughs> that, she, that, uh, that this person had actually been there. This is the guy who talks about past life regression. I think that would be somebody pretty easy to talk to about something like this. But um, so in this room, are there any people who have had visitations, like physical, real world visitations from people who have been passed? How many? Let me just look around. We're talking 350 people, 30, 40 people in here. 10% of the audience has had actual, you actually saw someone. Who was it? Does someone have a, you have a mic? Can we just pass a mic over? Where's the mic? Can we just grab the mic? There's Nancy. Nancy, if you were dressed in white, you could just fly down here. I didn't go shopping in Santorini. <laughs> You're such a virgin anyway. It's, uh, <laughs> yes, I saw my cousin. Your cousin? Yes. Tell us. Okay. Uh, was in my dream. Mm -hmm. um, was the day that he died. Was and the day I he didn't know. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that he was there at the moment. So I am away and he was saying, Sandra, Sandra, come here. You say, why? No, I want to show you something. So when he showed me, he a little showed closer me, to you. Bring okay, the there. Mm -hmm. he showed me like a a path that was going through a bright light. Mm -hmm. And he said me, now I want that you see me the I go in peace. Because when you are going in peace, I think so. You are in peace all the time. He said, no, I have been so bad, and, and I think so, I have to go. Mm. So, at the moment, I feel like the, the white rope surround to me, mm -hmm. and I awake. And a few hours later, was in the morning, in the morning, something, we received a phone call from my aunt. They say that my cousin was shot, that he was dead. Mm. So, so you actually saw him? Could you actually have a... Yes. Yeah. Now, and I could go around the room, but I'm just conscious that of so much that I want to do today. That I, But it's, um, it's a rather common thing. But when it happened for me with my mom, um, I, I had to jump out of the bed, and, uh, and she was like, Right there, I mean, I could a physical being that I could touch. It was uh, I still get sh shaken up when I, when I go through that. So that we're constantly in this state of bringing things from the non-being into the world of being. And um, don't be surprised if after you begin to practice some of the things that uh, we talk about here on this trip, and and you begin to move into this world of, of the world of spirit, that um, you'll start seeing things just show up, just automatic, just manifest, which is the highest place, the highest level of consciousness. It's placing your mind on your attention on what it is on something, and then having it instantaneously uh, show up. Uh, Deepak and I used to talk about the, uh, the, the four ways to have strawberry ice cream. The first way is to have a thought, yeah, I'd like to have some strawberry ice cream. And then you get up and you go get the strawberry ice cream, but you have a thought. <clears throat> and then you go and get your strawberry ice cream. And it doesn't seem like much because we can all do that. But um, you have to, if you try to process what's going on, you have a thought. And then you get up and you uh, actually go do it. The thought is invisible. I'd like to have some strawberry ice cream. Where is that? Where is that? You can't find that. You, know? 
you can find you can find the uh, command center in your brain which says I'd like to have some strawberry ice cream but you can never find the commander in the command center that says I'd like to have some strawberry ice cream that's just in the world of spirit that's where your excitement is that's where God is a second way to have strawberry ice cream it's a little higher level of consciousness is to say I'd really like to have some strawberry ice cream and then you send one of your children to get it that's a higher level because you have a thought and you sit there and you send someone else to get it and then here comes your strawberry ice cream the third way to get strawberry ice cream is to have a thought gee I'd really like to have some strawberry ice cream commander in the command center says that and someone walks by could happen on this ship and says excuse me is this your strawberry ice cream and when that happens and it happens to all of us we go booga 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 what's going on I was just thinking strawberry ice cream and you just dropped it off for me and you just brought it to me did I manifest in you how many have had an experience like that in their life like every hand and when we do we call it a coincidence don't we <laughs> and the word coincidence of course comes from the mathematics coincide and two angles that fit together perfectly are said to coincide so we've taken this term that means something that shows up deliberately as part of the perfection of the universe and call it something that shows up accidentally. It's that twisted things around because we just can't believe anything beyond our senses is possible. So that's the three ways to get strawberry ice cream. The fourth way to get strawberry ice cream is to have a thought Gee, I'd really like to have some strawberry ice cream. And you manifest it. It's there. And all of you do it for one third of your life. If you need some strawberry ice cream in your dream, you don't have to get up and get out of bed, <laughs> put on your clothes, and go to go up to the store and buy some strawberry ice cream. You just have it. And if you want some chocolate to put on top of it, you just have that thought. That's exactly what Jesus was doing with the gift of fish and loaves. Was it the two? Was it? I always get that mixed up. It was either two fish and five loaves of bread, or five uh, fish and two loaves of bread. It was one of those two. Which one was it? Two fish, five loaves of bread, and he fed the multitudes just by changing his thought and putting it on and raising the dead. He calls those things which do not exist as though they did. So, but that's a little off the, what I want to speak about. So it was 1967, and um, it was the year my daughter was born, my daughter Tracy. So it was 45 years ago. And um, I'm just afraid I'm gonna fuck flying off of this chair up here. That's why I keep moving around. Inside. And um, I was, uh, I had just completed my master's degree as a counselor. <clears throat> and um, I was applying to the uh, PhD program in uh, clinical psychology, counseling psychology. And I was a school counselor at uh, Mercy High School in Michigan, all-girls school, brand new, fairly new school, 1,300 Catholic school girls, grade 9 to 12. And it was a Monday night in September, first Monday night, that was a Tuesday night, it was after the day after Labor Day. And um, it was my job to give a talk to all of the parents at the um, at the school so a couple of thousand parents showed up on Tuesday night and I gave a lecture a talk about what our expectations were for the school year for these uh, young women and when the talk was over I was 
very happy with it, a little bit nervous about it, hadn't done much public speaking. Um, I um, went home. My daughter was, um, she was born on August 1st, so she was like 30 days old. <laughs> um, and I went back uh, to school the next day, Wednesday morning, and a young woman in the ninth, ninth or tenth grade, walked into my office. Her name was Nancy Armstrong, and she handed me a book. And she said, my mother was at your talk last night, and she was so impressed with what you had to say. And you were talking about things that she wasn't expecting you to talk about, because I was talking about these girls as God, as divine beings who can manifest and create and bring anything into their world that they want to, that there are no limitations on what they can do. And that's how I will be running this school. I was working as the director of the counseling program there and also filled in as principal on occasion for the school. Um, and she said, my mother is a member of the uh, Book of the Month Club. And she, um, if you buy so many books, you get a bonus book. So if you buy four books in three months period or something else, they just send you these bonuses. And they sent her this bonus book. And she wants, she's not going to read it. It doesn't interest her. But she thought, based on what she heard you say last night, that this might be of interest to you. Would you like it? And I said, thank you very much. I'd love to have it. And it was a turning point in my life. When I wrote, um, I can see clearly now, I go back to that moment as one of the absolute turning points. A, I was going in this direction and I did a U-turn and I went in a different direction. Because of that moment, with Nancy Armstrong, and I haven't, how many students I've had over the years, that I would remember her, and I can see her in her little blue uniform walking into my office as if it were yesterday. And now that was the day, that Wednesday, that I was to go down to the university in Detroit, Wayne State University, and I was to uh, fill out my, to, comp to turn in my plan of work for my PhD program, what courses I was going to take, um, what my dissertation was going to look like, um, you know, your whole plan for the next three years. That was 1967, and I got my PhD, and uh, I, I finished my orals on the f 4th of May, 1970. I remember it because it was the day of Kent State. It was the day that our government decided to put President Nixon ordered the soldiers to put live bullets into the guns with the National Guard and to fire it into the students who were protesting the war in Vietnam, where my brother was almost killed and received the Bronze Star. And you can imagine how I felt about that war, or how I feel about any war. Um, and four students were shot that day. Uh, and there's a memorial to them at Kent State. You remember that? How many remember? You must remember. Some of you weren't born yet, but uh, but even people in, that are from other countries probably remember the horror of uh, firing. They just did it in South Africa just a few weeks ago. The firing on the miners. I don't know if you saw that. It's just uh, beyond. Oh, don't let me go there. <laughs> so. Um, I took my orals that day, May the 4th, 1970. I was supposed to take them at uh, 4 o'clock, and they postponed it till 7 o'clock because there was such mourning and all of that. Um, and I received my Ph.D. June the 7th, uh, about a month later. I mean, I, I was handed my degree. So here it was back in 1967, and um, I had an appointment with my advisor. Her name was Dr. Mildred Peters brilliant, beautiful woman, a uh, woman who I thought was very old. She's probably <clears throat> 10 years younger than I am now. <laughs> but um, 
and she was a PhD at that time as a full professor in a university. You, know, you have to understand that was 1967. She had been a professor for 30 or 40 years, so she got her PhD in the 1920s, and the women got the vote in America in 1920, when my mother was four years old. So for the first 150 years of our history as an American democracy, women weren't even allowed to vote. So all of the people who say they want to return to what the Founding Fathers wanted have to remember that the Founding Fathers did not think women were important enough to vote. And if you were black, forget it. You were considered to be 60% of a person. That was our Founding Fathers that so many people over here on the right think we should do everything they wanted. I love it when I see the women of the Tea Party out there saying we want to do what our founding fathers did. <laughs> anyway, that's another place I don't want to go. <laughs> Maybe I just wanted to put it on tape. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, I um, so I was scheduled and I had already filled out my plan of work and I knew what I wanted to study, what direction I was going to go, I was going to, I was going to do things on, uh, uh, I was going to study B.F. Skinner and uh, a lot of the uh, conditioning things and, uh, and move in that direction, Jungian analysis and so on. And uh, a school finished at three o'clock. And I didn't have to, I had an appointment with Dr. Peters at 7 o'clock. So I had to make a decision about how, what I would do for the next four hours. Do I stay in my office or do I drive down to the university and, and kill time down there? Um, and I opted to uh, stay in my office and pick up this book that I brought with me because it has so much significance to me. This is it. This is what it looks like. And... Um, it's all worn out, and uh, I'm going to sit over here because that stool is just. Can you see me back there? Saying, oh my goodness. I think I'm going to become a guru. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> so um, the book is called The World of Psychology, uh, edited with introductions by uh, G.B. Levitas. It's uh, published by George Braziller, Braz Braziller, I guess, in New York, published in 1963. And it is a collection of writings. It has, it has writings from Pavlov and Freud and Voltaire and uh, Franz Kafka and William Butler Yeats and Nietzsche and Nathaniel Hawthorne and Cicero and um, Aldous Huxley and Rudyard Kipling and um, Philip Roth, St. Augustine, Margaret Mead, Jean-Paul Sartre, um, Henry James, St. Augustine, St. John of the Cross, which I've read so many times. I'm going to give a lecture on it in Maui on divine love in January. Um, Carl Jung, who was my teacher. Um, John Stuart Mill, Robert Browning, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And there was a man in here whose name I didn't know at the time. His name was Abraham Maslow. And... Uh, and there's an essay in here called um, Self-Actualizing People. So I had never heard that term. So I um, looked at that and I just liked the idea. It was called The Whole Man, W-H-O-L-E, The Whole Man. And I picked it up and I read that entire piece. It's about 30 pages, very small print. It's quite a bit to take in. And it described people in a way that I had never seen people described before. And when I read it, it was the first time in my life that I felt there was somebody out there who understood me. That I wasn't so crazy. I mean, I had been in trouble my whole life in one way or another, with the system, with organizations, with the culture, with um, resisting um, being enculturated, with um, not 
I'm following the rules with um, some of you have heard me tell the story. I can't sit when I do this. I got to stand. <laughs> um, have heard me tell the story of um, when I was in the third grade in Mount Clemens, Michigan, and I came home from school and I asked Mrs. Scarf, whose home we lived at, what's a scurvy elephant? You've heard me tell it. It's so famous story now. Um, and she said, I don't know. What do you mean? I've never heard that term. And I said, well, I heard Mrs. Poole, who was my third grade teacher, telling the principal that Wayne Dyer was in her classroom and that he was a scurvy elephant. So she got on the phone and she called the principal and the principal said, oh, that's Wayne. He gets everything mixed up. She didn't say that he was a scurvy elephant in her classroom. She said that he was a disturbing element <laughs> in her classroom. And huh. and so I have that, like I, I ran into that when you when you ultimately would we publish. Um, uh, I can see clearly now, I t I, so many of the stories that I recall that are significant in my life that were turning points or that were reminders that, that I was in this training program that brought me here today and it brought me to the next thing I'm going to write, which is about uh, don't fence me in, about the soul needing to expand and, um, and about divine love and brought me to people like Peter Dunov in Bulgaria and and uh, St. John of the Cross and Lao Tzu, who changed my life and called me to live the Tao for a year, and St. Francis. And, and um, so I, I read this essay, and at the end of the essay, it says, he, he puts it like this. Well, first, he gives a little description. I left my glasses in the room, so... Um, but I'm really training my eyes. They actually, I honestly feel that I've been working on with my eyes and, and making them see better. And I actually see better than I did uh, even just a few years ago. Um, <laughs> no, I, uh, this is something I couldn't read a couple of years ago, and I've been just doing, uh, you know, I am perfect eyesight. I am perfect eyesight. I say it on a regular basis. Uh, he says, well, this is one of the paragraphs, he says, to take the teacher-student relationship, just talking about teachers and students, as a specific paradigm, our teacher subjects, he's talking about these subjects now, they studied hundreds and hundreds of people that they called self-actualizers. They behaved in a very unneurotic way, simply by interpreting situations differently than normal people do. Uh, they, uh, they experience the teaching experience as a pleasant collaboration rather than as a clash of wills, or wills of authority, or of dignity, and so on. The replacement of artificial dignity that is easily and inevitably threatened with a natural simplicity that is not easily threatened. The giving up of the attempt to be omniscient and omnipotent. The absence of student-threatening authoritarianism. The refusal to regard the students as competing with each other or with the teacher. The refusal to assume the professor stereotype and the insistence on remaining as realistically human as, say, a plumber or a carpenter. All of these, a carpenter, all of these created a classroom atmosphere in which suspicion, wariness, defensiveness, hostility, and anxiety absolutely just disappeared. So also do similar threat uh, reports, t uh, responses rather, tend to disappear in marriages, in families, and in other interpersonal situations when threat itself is just reduced. So there's no, I'm better than you kind of thing. No, I was in the field of psychology. Uh, I had my master's degree. I was going for a doctorate. Um, and I had planned out a whole thing on, on what I wanted to study and kind of what I wanted to do. And, um, and then I read this last line of this essay. Now, that's just one paragraph in it. This just, I don't know about you, but that just blows me away. Just that. Just that whole idea of just reducing uh, suspicion and redu reducing threat and, and making education and parenting and relationship a collaboration, a mutual collaboration where you're 
your goal is to just assist each other, and there's no competition in this classroom. I was a teacher for so many years, and I, I don't even understand the concept of cheating in school. How can you cheat? How is it possible to cheat? What are you there in school for? To pass a test or to get an education? If your job is to get an education, then what you get on a test has nothing to do with an education. Tests just measure how well you take tests. That's all they measure. And, and so it's like if you're looking over for somebody, you should be able to reach over and ask them. But I don't, you know, worrying about whether I'm getting this answer and you're going to get ahead of me and I'm in a competition with you. It's like, how may I serve? You take in a classroom the students who know the most and you have them help the students who don't know and help them bring them along because anybody who's ever been a teacher or even a parent knows that the best way to learn something is to teach it. That's the best way. It's like, you know, I have to go over this stuff and think about it and meditate on it. I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning asking myself, what can I say? How can I do this the best way I can? What examples can I use? I think about it. It's, on, it's constantly on my mind. And it makes me a better teacher. But I'm not up here because I'm smarter than anybody else in this room. There's people in this room way smarter than I am in so many dimensions. I don't even know how to turn my radio on without getting the, the things fixed, mixed up. My kids will tell you that. I'm an absolute retard when it comes to a thousand things in life. Okay? So nobody is any better than anybody else. But here's what he said at the end of the... of this beautiful essay, this life-changing essay. You can imagine I've carried this with me for 45 years. <laughs> uh, I'd never let it out. Of, I, I, I travel with it. I slept with it last night. <laughs> it was wonderful. That's why it's got marks all over it. No, never mind. <laughs> Will you behave yourself? Somebody, I did, that was, uh, I didn't. <laughs> Serena, you did not hear that. In this, as in other ways, healthy people, he just called self-actualizers healthy people, are so different from average ones, not only in degree, but in kind as well, that they, there it is, they, they generate two very different kinds of psychology. I've underlined all of this, so this is, uh, you know, it's, it smudges all over it. It becomes more and more clear that the study, and I love this line, it becomes more and more clear, now listen to this, that the study of crippled, stunted, immature, and unhealthy specimens can yield only a crippled psychology and a crippled philosophy. The study of self-actualizing people must be the basis for a more universal science of psychology. Maslow was the first person to say that we're going to, psychology is going to be this field where we study human behavior and what people are capable of doing and accomplishing and trying to identify in various personalities and so on, that we have been studying what's wrong with people. We've been studying the weakest among us. And as a result of studying the weakest among us, we make assumptions and predictions about what humanity is capable or not capable of. And Maslow said, that's the wrong approach. What we need to do is study the, the, the highest developed among us, the geniuses, the ones who have accomplished just these fantastic things in spite of all the odds against them and make predictions and assumptions about what humanity is capable of on the basis of the most brilliant among us. Now the place that I separated from Maslow, and Maslow became a great teacher in my life, a mentor. I told you I, I, I took my orals on the 4th of May. That was after eight years of anals. <laughs> that's what I always used to say, because that's how it feels when you're in that program, believe me. <laughs> um, but June the 7th, 1970, the day that I walked across the stage at Cobo Hall in downtown Detroit, where I'm speaking on November the 7th this year, I'm going to be back on the same stage just a couple of months from now. 
that same day, in that same hour that I was receiving my doctorate, Abraham Maslow passed away in Menlo Park, California. Now, you know, we just, it's hard for us to get that, but that there's, there's really a message in that. I always say it was as if he was passing on the baton. It was as if he said, I've explained all of this to the uh, academic world and to the business people and the researchers. And now I want you to explain it to the cab drivers and the school teachers and the beauticians and the lawyers and the doctors and the nurses and the carpenters and the plumbers. It's, um, I think about the irony of those dates and I think, you know, the story just pops into my head about, you know, in 1776 in America, um, there was uh, this incredible document that was, uh, you know, to change the whole face of um, how we govern people, called the Declaration of Independence. And it was written by uh, Thomas Jefferson. And, um, and the guy who was responsible for putting it all into practice was a man named John Adams, who was the second president, but he was basically the writer of the Constitution and the implementer of the ideas in the Declaration of Independence. That was July the 4th, 1776. Fast forward 50 years, a half a century. So it would make it July 4th, 1826, right? In Menlo Park. Oh, in Menlo Park is where um, Maslow passed away. In um, Monticello, in Virginia, Thomas Jefferson was lying on his deathbed. And he said, Adams lives. And he closed his eyes and died on the 50th anniversary of the writing and signing of the Declaration of Independence. And in Massachusetts, Boston, Massachusetts, lying on his deathbed was John Adams on the 4th of July, 1826, in the same hour. And his last words were, Jefferson lives. Now that's a true story. <laughs> So, you know, how, how can, you know, when I think about the timing and so on, I mean, that story always pops into my head. So, I got in my car, and I drove down to the university, and I met with Dr. Peters, this woman I've written a lot about, and I can see clearly now, she was such a monumental influence in my life. She just took me under her wing and uh, saw something in me that no one else had ever seen before at the university, at any of the university programs that I had been in since I started in 1962. And um, I said, D uh, Dr. Peters, I would really like to uh, redo my plan of work. I don't want to study what I thought I was going to study. I want to study self-actualization. That's what I want to write my dissertation on. That's what I want to study. Um, and she redid the whole thing. There was not even a provision in the curriculum for such a thing. And she was the kind of person, she was also a scurvy elephant. And she allowed me to do it any way that I wanted to do it, to take the courses that I wanted to take, to, to do the doctoral work that I wanted to do, and so on. And then I was to meet Maslow. He was to become a mentor in my life. Um, so basically what he said is that there are some people who are just wired together differently. Now, where I differed from Maslow, but I do not believe that if Maslow had lived longer, that he would have, uh, he wouldn't have grown because his whole life was a movement away from Freudian psychology and psychoanalytic theory and Jungian analysis and so on into this field of, of self-actualization. 
So he was always growing, and the same thing is true of all of the great masters. You know. So, but at that time, he said that um, self-actualization is restricted to a limited number of people, and that um, it's only available for this very, very small minority. And when you read that, and you read toward a psychology of being, and you read his. Uh, uh, Eusychia, wasn't that the title of one of his books, Eusychia? Uh, he created a whole society based, at, based on uh, self-actualized people and so on. But basically he, he said that these people differed in certain ways. Now I just jotted them down um, so that I could just share you know, a little bit about the differences in these people. Um, and it, it's just... As I was, as I would, the more I would read, and the more I got to know Maslow, and the more I got to read his material and to study it, and to see it, I began to. And, and now, at this point in my life, now, I mean, I, my suggestion is that if, if it's in any one of us, it's in all of us. That's it. We all have this capacity to reach these exalted levels. Remember, Maslow was the one that had the pyramid, and started at the base with just our basic needs and moved up through a sense of belonging and a sense of love and a need for love. And, and at the top was this pyramid. And at the top of this pyramid is uh, self-actualization. And as a school administrator and as a school therapist and counselor and so on, I used to, uh, I used to give talks to teachers a lot. I used, and I taught a lot of teachers in, in, uh, who were in their graduate programs. For, I was a professor doing that for seven years. And they used to always write their philosophy out for the school, and they always say, it is, it is our ambition to have our students become as, and they would even use the term, as self-actualized as possible. Um, and it was because any time any student started showing any signs of self-actualization, of being this kind of a human being, everything in the system was designed and designated to out to identify those people and to get them out. They're labeled troublemakers. They're, they're people who, who don't fit in. And I always think of E.E. E. Cummings, this um, beautiful spiritual teacher who wrote everything in lower case. I love that, if nothing else. <laughs> to be nobody but yourself in a world which is doing its best night and day to make you just like everybody else means to fight the greatest battle there is to fight and never stop fighting. That was E.E. E. Cummings. To be nobody but yourself in a world which is doing its very best to make you just like everybody else means to fight the greatest battle there is to fight and never stop fighting. And when I read Maslow, when I read that day back in 19, in, in the fall of 1967, when my little girl was just a, a brand new baby, uh, and I remember driving down to the university, I can tell you what kind of car I was driving in, I can tell you where I was parking, I can tell you what that meeting was like, I can tell you. And as I sat there with my feet up on my desk and all the students had left, Reading that, it just, it was like, I don't, it, it was one of the most glorious feelings that I'd ever had, that, uh, that there's somebody out there who, who, who gets it. And basically, he said these things. He said, these people, these subjects, he called them, these health, what he called healthy people, these healthy people are number one, probably most significantly, they are independent of the good opinion of other people. They do not do what they do based upon how other people are going to react to them. Now remember as we look at the ego and what it says is one of the, one of the, <coughs> one of the components of the ego is um, I am what other people think of me. I am my reputation. And how many of us are raised and are raising our children, are seeing our children being raised in a world in which 
peer group approval. You hear it all the time. I only do the peer group approval. I do it because there's so much peer pressure on me. You know, I have to fit in. Self-actualizing people have no sense of that in their life. It's, um, it's just not anything that they even consider. And it's not just in, in those ways. They, they don't even notice appearances. They don't notice... Um, one of the other qualities of these self-actualizing people is that they, are, they, they, they see the unfolding of God in, in everything and everyone that they encounter. It's like they don't, they see past appearances, but they don't just say it. It isn't like, this isn't just a talking game. This is something that they absolutely feel. That when they see another person, they don't even, they can't even tell very often whether that person, what, what uh, culture they came from or how tall they were or what color their skin was or what, uh, what they were wearing or what, uh, what, they, what, what work that they did or whatever. Those just were not the things that they saw. They just were able to look past that. I mean, my children were raised on this idea that it doesn't make any difference. I used to tell the story when my little girl was in preschool back in the 1960s. She was like three years old. And she came home from school and she had a, uh, a, a, a gold star on her, uh, on, on her paper for something that she had done. I think it was like she was adding something. They were just doing numbers or something. She was like four years old. And she came home and she said, Daddy, Daddy, look, 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 I was the only one in the class that got a gold star. And I said, um, what's what, what's the paper about? Like, what, 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 what were you doing? Oh, we were doing, I, I think it was adding. I said, well, wow, adding? That's terrific. You know how important it is to be able to add all the toys you have? Now you can tell how many you got, and you can make money, and... She said, Daddy, excuse me, Daddy, Daddy, I got a gold star. I was the only one in the room with a gold star. I said, honey, I don't care about the gold star. I said, teachers give out gold stars because, um, because it makes them feel like, uh, it makes them feel like they're doing their job, you know, and it makes, and it's just something that you, you know, they want people to think that maybe you're better than other kids in the class because you got this and they didn't. I said, I don't care about gold stars. I said, it's just not interesting. But, but that you can add? That's terrific. This is how I talk to my kids. She came home from school about a month later, and she had uh, handed me a paper, and you can see she had thumbprints all over it. And, and um, there had been a star at the top of the page. And you can see that it had been taken off. <laughs> and uh, her little prints were on there. <laughs> I can remember this like it was yesterday also. And uh, so she looked, she showed me the paper. I said, what's this? She said, ah, we're doing subtracting. I said, subtracting at four? You know how to subtract? I can't believe it. That's incredible. We are wonderful. Do you see that money you have? I put some in my pocket. I said, that's called subtracting. Now you can figure it out. Isn't this great? You know, you can go through life. You can add. You can subtract. And she just fine. And she went back. And I said, Tracy, I said, here, come here, honey. I said, uh, what was this at the top of the page? This looks like it was torn off. Oh, she said, yeah, the teacher, she gave me a gold star. I said, well, what did you do with it? She said, I gave it back to her. I said, well, what did you say to her? What did she do? She said, I just told her to give it to someone who needs that sort of thing. That I'm not. That's a true story. But look at how much of our life is based upon this whole idea of having to fit in and having to be just like everybody else. I always, I love to tell this story because it's, uh, there was a great professor at the, at the university. His name was uh, Fritz Radl, R-E-D-L. You can look him up, you can Google him. Um, he was um, from Vienna, from Austria. He worked with Anna Freud and um, knew uh, uh, Carl Jung and Freud and, and, uh, and he
he was uh, he was just the greatest guy. He was just like his classes at the university. We had these um, huge auditoriums where you know there might be like twelve, fifteen hundred students in the class, and whenever Radel would teach a class, his class would be absolutely filled. Everybody just loved his class. He was humorous. He was fun. He was everything that I read to you about the teacher-student relationship. You know, he didn't put himself above other people. And this man had written. He wrote. He wrote a book called Controls from Within. And uh, he wrote. He, he had started uh, in the city of Detroit in downtown Detroit. He set up a place for adolescent boys who were uh, drug addicts and on the street. And he would go over there and work with them. I and mean, this is the kind of guy he was. Just beautiful man. So I took every course I could get of his when I was in my uh, working on my master's degree. I took all of his, uh, and they would offer them. I'd be the first one to sign up. And then when I got in the doctoral program, they have a seminar, and the seminar is um, a case study seminar. And he would uh, conduct the seminar every Thursday night, and it would be uh, for three hours, from seven to ten. But only six people were allowed in the in the in the seminar, doctoral students, and there were like maybe thirty doctoral students. But getting in was uh, you had to get in by lottery to get into his. That's how popular he was. Uh, and I wanted to take that seminar more than anything because we would do we would go out and do case studies with patients, people that we were working with, and then we would. Uh, bring them there, and then we would present them, and then he would give us this brilliant analysis. He and Maslow were, um, they worked together. So they were colleagues. So <clears throat> I got in the seminar through the uh, lottery, which was really Mildred Peters pulling strings, for sure. And she's here now acknowledging that. I mean, I, I talk to Millie all the time. I can call her Millie now. She doesn't care about the PhD anymore. <laughs> um, I didn't even know when she died, but I assume she's dead. Because she was maybe 60 then, and that was 50 years ago. <laughs> so uh, anyway, she was... Uh, and I see her a lot, especially when I have questions, when I'm struggling, when I have areas that I'm wondering what to do and so on. When you read, uh, I can see clearly now, I talk to her about major decisions in my life. When I left Michigan and went to New York to become a professor and left everything in order to go to, an, to, to the big city. Because I had heard a song that says, if I can make it there... <laughs> I can make it anywhere, and that's honestly what drove me there, because I had a wonderful position offered at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and I turned it down to go to St. John's University in New York City, figuring if I can handle New York, I can. That's it was the bigger challenge, and that's what she pointed out to me, and that's when I made the decision. But um, so. Um, so we had our seminar on Thursday, and there were six of us in there. And nobody was ever late. Nobody ever missed Radel's uh, classes. It was, it was like being with, um, you know, it was, like, it was like being with Carl Jung and, and having a seminar with him. When you're in the field that I'm in, that's big. Or having, if you're a poet, having Carl Sandberg as, as your teacher or whatever, you know, just. Uh, I used to sit next to him and just be just so honored to be there. So it was time for our midterm, and he came in, <laughs> and he um, he told us to get out your blue books, and we took out the, the blue book, and we started to write our, uh, and he said, we're all prepared to write for, for an hour or whatever it was, and he says, he, t he tells this story, <clears throat> he said, a self-actualized man is invited to a dinner party. He shows up at the dinner party, and everyone is dressed in formal attire. Black tie, 
dresses, gowns, whatever. Semi-formal attire. And he arrives at the party in a pair of blue jeans, tennis shoes, t-shirt, and a baseball hat. What does he do? He said, you have 15 minutes. And he left the room. So we all took out our blue books <laughs> and we started writing. He wouldn't pay attention to that. He wouldn't allow himself to be intimidated by that. He wouldn't be upset about it. He wouldn't let himself get nervous. He would go on as if it were okay. He wouldn't pay attention. He's not interested in appearances. Blah, 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 blah. We all did what we thought was the right answer. He came back into the room after 15 minutes. And he, um, he said, everybody read your answer. So there's six of us, two women, myself and three other men. And we each read our answers. And I was so proud of mine as I was writing and just going on and on. And then everybody read it. And he took his briefcase like this and he picked it up and he threw it down on the table. He said, you've all failed. You haven't learned a damn thing. He walked out of the room in anger. Slammed the door. Now, this was not like Radel at all. You know, we knew, I knew he was acting, but I didn't know the answer. <laughs> and um, he came back into the room and he said, all you had to do was write three words. And he took out a piece of chalk, and he wrote on the board, he wouldn't notice. Now that tells you how far you have to go. <laughs> he wouldn't notice. It's like, these are people who see the unfolding of God in everything and everyone they encounter. And they just simply don't notice. They are independent of the good opinion of other people. They see the unfolding of God in everyone they encounter. They are detached from outcome. That is, they do not what, do what they do in their life because of some outcome that may come their way. He called it, he said, they are growth motivated, not deficiency motivated. There's a very big distinction between being growth motivated and distinction or, or uh, deficiency motivated. A deficiency motivated person is motivated on a basis of repairing what is wrong with them and fixing it. A growth motivated person is saying wherever I am is perfect and I can go so much further but I have nothing to put down. I have no deficiencies. This is where I am. It's summed up in this simple little bumper stipper, stipper, sticker. <laughs> you don't have to be sick to get better. You don't have to be sick to get better. So, these are people, he said, who must be what they can be. I am really summarizing this because I want to close out and get to the satsang. They are, <clears throat> they must be what they can be. Now, this isn't that they must be what somebody else thinks that they can be. This isn't somebody who must be fitting into something else because another quality and characteristics of these people is that they are resistant to enculturation. These are people who do not identify themselves on the basis of a culture, their culture. 
They see themselves as a global being connected to all of humanity. And they, are, they do not run their life on the basis of the Tao. It wasn't until I read the Tao, and I don't mean just read the Tao Te Ching, but studied it and lived it for that full year when I turned 65, um, that I understood that virtually everything that Lao Tzu was writing about is what Maslow was speaking about with these people. That they don't, I mean, Lao Tzu had, had uh, contempt for the law and laws. He said that people who run their life on the basis of what the law says are not Tao-centered people. Thoreau called it, uh, he wrote an essay on the necessity of civil disobedience. On the necessity of civil disobedience. That is, when I said that women got the vote in America in 1920, they didn't get it because men finally decided to give it to them. They got it because a lot of women just got up there and actually got persecuted and many of them murdered and killed for it. And we didn't get civil rights in this country because a whole bunch of people decided that it was time to give them. Civil rights were earned in this country by people who went out there and marched. People like Rosa Parks from my hometown in Detroit in 1955 in, in Alabama. You know, sitting on the bus and saying, I won't go to the back. That um, so many of the horrors that have been committed in our culture and our society have been committed by people saying, I'm only doing my job. You know, this is, this is how the whole scene of... Uh, what happened in the Holocaust and in World War II took place. I'm just doing my job. And there are others who said, this is something that we can no longer tolerate, the civil disobedience, doing things because it's written down someplace for self-actualizing people is an impossibility. And one of the most significant things that self-actualizing people do is that they never place into their imagination anything that they do not want to materialize and manifest. They never put into their imagination their thoughts about what is possible or not possible on the basis of um, what they have been told ought to be in their imagination. And, it, and it's like they seem to have a, a, a a grasp on um, thinking in a way that I spoke about earlier and I'll be speaking about at our final session before we do the meditation. This whole idea of understanding that our imagination is our sacred place. It's a sacred spot within us. And so we don't want to put anything in there like I'm, I'm, I'm only I'm only able to do what I've always done. I'm only able to imagine what other people have conditioned me to believe that I can do. What's, all, what's already happened. I don't place into my imagination anything that someone else has uh, imposed upon me, like Ivan Illich. They place into their imagination, into their thoughts, that which they already believe is here for them, and they're just reconnecting to it. And just see if I've covered them. They're very great, greatly familiar with and loving the unknown. Wandering into the unknown, the mysterious is the most exciting thing for them. To me, said Walt Whitman, the most glorious thing in the universe is the most mysterious. And they're not looking for security. They're not looking for doing things the way everybody else does things. They have a sense of awe. Rumi said, uh, sell your cleverness and purchase bewilderment. Go through life being bewildered. And that's how these people live their lives. It's like this sense of awe at everything. And when they would see something new, they saw something 
even if they'd seen it a thousand times before, they saw it like a, a like a, a little child saw it. In fact, self-actualizing people are very close to little children. They um, they see things. You know, I have a poem that I'll be uh, from Rumi uh, that I'll be reciting and acting out in Ephesus about. Uh, the sheik who loved to play with children and how childlike they were. Mary Oliver, this wonderful poet in, in Massachusetts, was asked what the most significant things in life are, and she said, uh, there are three things. She said, one, go through life being astonished. Two, she said, um, tell other people about it. Be astonished and share it with other people. Be astonished. Be, be in a state of awe at all times in your life for everything. You know, I, this is my third or fourth trip to, uh, to Greece. And I can hardly wait to uh, get over there and walk among that Parthenon again and just, just feel the excitement that, you know, Socrates really sat here. <laughs> And Plato was right here, and Aristotle, they were, these people were right here, and they were breathing in the same air that I'm breathing, and looking at the same sun, and looking at the same moon, and looking at the same stars, and walking on these same streets. Uh, that doesn't get old. Nothing gets old. Be in a state of awe. And this is, and being in awe at it over and over and over again. Great love for children, spontaneous, and an acceptance of the world without complaint. An acceptance of a, like an absence of judgment. One of the great things that I learned in reading the uh, I Am Discourses is on page 318. Okay, eyes, you have perfect eyesight. <laughs> the student should constantly, constantly look within his human self and see what habits or creations are there that need to be plucked out and disposed of. For only by refusing to any longer allow habits of judging, condemning, and criticizing to exist can he be free. The true activity of the student is only to perfect his own world, and he cannot do it as long as he sees imperfection in the world of another of God's children. That any time you find yourself being critical, condemning, or judgmental towards any of God's children, you have lost your connection to self-actualization. Non-judgmental not putting anybody down, not putting any labels on anybody else, and having love for everyone, for the dignity of all, even those who perform the most heinous of acts, to be able to find love in them. I remember a patient of mine, a woman years ago, whose, uh, whose son was uh, killed by a drunk driver. And... Um, the drunk driver was uh, put in jail, and um, no, it wasn't a drunk driver, I'm sorry, he, uh, he was murdered. He was murdered. The guy was drunk, but he was murdered. And he had been in jail for 16 or 17 years in California. And the woman hadn't had a day's rest in 17 years. Just so filled with anger towards this murderer. And I remember telling her over and over again, you will never find peace until you go there, until you see this man, until you're able to let it go and forgive him. She said, I can't do that. I just, I just simply can't do it. And ultimately, because she was just getting sicker and sicker herself, she went and... Um, she confronted this man who, uh, and it's a long story, and I, I'm, 
out of time now, but uh, once she did this, she said she had her first night's sleep in 17 years. And then she became a collaborator with him. And, um, they wrote some, some works to help other people who had been victims like this herself. Totally changed her life around. And who's to say that her son didn't incarnate for just that purpose? These are people who have no judgment, no condemnation, no criticism towards anyone. So, what I'd like to do now, so that's self-actualization, that was the turning point in my life. And I have always studied and raised my children, and as a teacher myself, with a belief that um, self-actualization is there for all of us, that we can all become these people who are resistant to fitting in, to enculturation, to doing things the way everybody else does things, and taking the words of E.E. E. Cummings. Okay, so I'd like you to, if you will, um, just take everything off of your laps, if you will. I don't think you should be writing. And um, I'd like to give you the uh, definition of a satsang. We'll probably go till about five or ten after today, so. So I looked it up, but I, but I, I, I had my first satsang in um, uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, 25 years ago wandered into it because my wife and I were lost and we couldn't find a uh, restaurant, a health food restaurant that we were looking for. And we saw all of these people in there and just wandered in. And uh, um, and there was a woman in there named Ganga Ji. Ganga Ji. Have anybody heard of Ganga Ji? Some of you have. Brilliant, beautiful soul. Turns out she had read one of my earlier books called uh, You'll See It When You Believe It. And it was what brought her and her sister back together. They hadn't talked to each other for 10 years because her sister thought she was just too weird. They were from Mississippi or someplace down there where talking like this is just not considered to be things that normal people do. And uh, she read, you'll see it when you believe it, and called her sister and they got back together. So she was thrilled that I happened to walk in there and now we've become friends. So, um, a satsang is a, a gathering of like mind, and I sat there in that room and just was just, it was such a peaceful place, and that's what I want to convert this to. You know, just a real, it's not a classroom. A satsang is not about a guru. It's not about the teacher. It's not about me at all. And it's not about learning anything. It's about love. It's about creating an atmosphere of love. It's a gathering of like-minded souls. The purpose is to bring you home to yourself. It's an assembly of persons who listen to and talk about and assimilate the truth. Typically involves listening to or reading scriptures, reflecting on or discussing and assimilating their meanings, meditating to the source of the words, and bringing their meaning into one's daily life. This is what... I've come up with is what a satsang is. So it's not a Q&A. We'll do that later. It's not a place where I can solve, you can ask me your problem, I'm going to solve your problem, and 300 people are going to sit there and say, why are we doing this? It has nothing to do with me. I've resolved all of that. It's, um, it's just about sharing. And there are mics here. There's a mic there. Nancy and... Uh, I think there's a mic on either side, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we'll just pass it if you want to say something. Um, I'm going to ask someone to come up to the stage and start this satsang today. Uh, her name is uh, uh, Dr. Catherine May. And um, she'll come up. She's a member of the group. I met her the other day. And she was sent here to me and handed me a book, which people do all the time. I mean, people do it all the time. <laughs> and told me that she had received some channeled information. And um, gave me a letter. And generally, when people give me a letter like that, um, 
and tell me that it was channeled. There's a purpose behind it, usually to try to get me to uh, get behind what they've done or help them publish it or whatever. And uh, this is Catherine, Dr. May. And um, so she handed me this thing and, uh, and, and gave me this letter um, and handed me this book called Who Needs Light, which she self-published. And um, so it's been like a magnet, this book. I mean, I've had it for, what, three days now? How long? We, this is the third? Yeah, third day. Yeah, this is the third day. And I just keep going back to it. And I mean, I have so many things to think about and what I want to talk about and so many books. And I don't like to carry it. I don't want another book. What am I going to do with this? I can't carry any more things. My weight's going to be over. They're going to charge me. I'm an orphan with leukemia. I can't handle it. You know, all of, <laughs> uh, all of the self-pitying stuff. And, uh, and so um, we also have uh, someone here who is a concert violinist, I understand, uh, from Luxembourg. And um, maybe um, you can really play softly while uh, Catherine reads um, to this group what, um, what she had channeled for her the other night. I guess it was on the ship, was it? And this is, um, this is one of the most brilliant books I've ever read. And I talked to the publisher at Hay House, uh, my friend Reed, and uh, I said I want to uh, I want to do more with this. I want to get this. I want this to become part of Hay House's uh, work. It's just it's just too good. Uh, it's brilliant. <laughs> this is one in a thousand, one in a million. So don't hand me anything, okay? I can't read another thing, and I'm very good. Don't want to pay any more at the, my, my luggage. <laughs> But um, this is a brilliant, brilliant woman sitting next to me who is, a, who is a doctor, PhD, like I have, in psychology, and has had her own practice. And, um, and she came here to teach me something, um, and perhaps to teach us all something. She had no idea I was going to bring her up today. I just told her when I walked in, I asked her if it was okay to come up must be a reason for everybody to hear what you uh, what you were told yeah what year were you born 1941 mm. well you're a child so <laughs> <laughs> so we're the same age um, so maybe you can just share with them I don't know if you want to read that or if you want to just say it so. well I can't just say it I probably wouldn't remember it okay properly put the mic real close to you if you can okay yeah. Um, this is a process that's been happening to me recently where I'm awakened in the middle of the night with a sharp pain in my toe. It's kind of a joke. It's called gout. Go <laughs> no, I've never had this pain before. And each time <clears throat> I hear, I have something to tell you. Oh, oh this is what happened the other night. I felt this tremendous sudden pain in my toe. And this is what I heard. So I got out of bed, got my pen and my paper, tried not to wake my roommate, so I wrote this in the dark. I think I can read it. I have a message for Wayne. I would like for you to give it to him. My dear son, you have done your work brilliantly. You have risen to every challenge and carried out every task selflessly. We love you beyond measure and wish to express our gratitude to you for awakening thousands of people through your tireless work. We now wish for you to do two things. First, reduce the pace of your appearances. Wait, wait a minute, hold on. Just, I think we're going to have to, we're gonna, I, mm. I don't think you can hear. I'm here seeing people. So we'll have to do it either real soft, yeah, way soft, much, much softer. Okay. 
softer maybe. And maybe if you go to the back of the room, yeah, that would be good. And do it softer because I don't want it. I want to hear the music. It's beautiful. Um, I'm envious of anyone who can make that happen with strings. So maybe you can start over at the top. I have a message for Wayne. I would like for you to give it to him. My dear son, you have done your work brilliantly. You have risen to every challenge and carried out every task selflessly. We love you beyond measure and wish to express our gratitude to you for awakening thousands of people through your tireless work. We now wish for you to do two things. First, reduce the pace of your appearances in the coming year to allow for a bit more rest and pleasure. You are healing, but we want to encourage you to now reap the rewards of your long life of service. You have planted seeds. They are flourishing in the minds of many. Now it is for you to encourage further growth by experiencing joy and unconditional love in your own life. Second, we wish for you to expand your message to include the material we have offered to the world on the subject of the coming ascension as we have given it through this channel, Catherine. We send her to you now to help you. She too has been on this path of ascension for thousands of years. You will recognize each other as colleagues, old friends, and co-conspirators in the long history of light works. You have each, in your own way, protected and defended my flame and preserved it through many eons of darkness. Catherine brings you a gift. It is the book we have compiled with long years of effort and great joy. You will find in its pages inspiration, a resource to provide creative material for you, for your own work, but most of all, healing and personal comfort for you, our dear son. Allow her to teach you the healing process she has been taught over decades. It is a contribution to the preparation for ascension which I want her to give to the world in the coming year. Do not hesitate to ask her to share her knowledge or her gift of unconditional love, which you will recognize as similar but not identical to your own. You have each followed a long and difficult path of learning and teaching. Share your rich experience to create a new direction in the offerings you present to the world. Catherine has worked with me, the one you know as I am that I am, with Ashtar and Saint Germain and many others. I will be sending information through her, which I will ask her to share with you as our work evolves and changes to prepare for the momentous events to come. I have important work for each of you as we enter this new phase of teaching. We admire your independence and your determination with which you have each developed your separate approaches. We would now ask you, if you are willing, to open your minds and your hearts to accept new and more expansive teachings which we will ask you to bring to the world in our names, as you have already done so well. We have sent Catherine to you this week to help you in many ways, which be will become clear as the week progresses. Look first to heal yourselves in the strong light of love and joy, which you will feel in abundance in the weeks and months to come. Go in love, my dear children. Enjoy the gifts we offer you as solace, 
as encouragement and in gratitude for your unwavering service. You, Wayne, are dear to us. We wish to remind you that, we wish to remind you of that, to express our fondest and deepest gifts, the violet flame of Saint Germain, the golden flame of your father, who loves you with every breath, and the blue diamond essence of your universal mother. Accept our love, our gifts, and our thanks. Go in peace, my children. Share these gifts with each other and with the world. You will soon find yourselves here with me as you make your transition to higher planes of existence. You will lead the way for many when the time comes. Lean on me, find joy in each other's gifts, and go forward fearlessly as you have done in the past. I will be here with you every step of the way. I am that I am. Je suis que je suis. Yahweh. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the music. Thank you. So, Catherine, why, why don't we start by you sharing? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a poem. Um, that I jotted down today. And then um, I'd like you to perhaps just open this um, satsang by telling this group um, what you have been doing, how you got sent here, and why you're sitting here today. Okay. So let these words in. This is a reading of the scripture. It's, called, it's from a book called Gifts with No Giver. I always thought that you would come to me in the shape of a beautiful lover. I never dreamed you would steal my heart with no shape at all. I always pretended I needed arms to hold me and lips to kiss away my pain. Yet I find fulfillment in the embrace of empty space. I always wanted, I always wished you would speak to me with words of tender sweetness. Now I know you whisper silently of your undying love. I always knew I would find you, although I foolishly looked with my eyes. You were here all along, hiding just out of sight in my heart. A beautiful. Well, you must have known I was coming. <laughs> mm. Well, this is something I've never done before, to bring someone up and have them, especially without so good. And there's been a magnet between what I've been reading, um, and you speak so, so beautifully and so brilliantly and so well-researched and so thoroughly um, and with such... Um, with such dignity and uh, about the difference between being a head people and heart people. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could just share a few words and then if anyone would like to speak to it and then we'll just kind of quietly uh, let these words in. Well, you spoke about self-actualization. That's also been my work. Um, to develop a technique to help um, approach renovating the neural circuitry that has been compromised by abuse or difficulty or cultural teachings. And in the process, I've learned from people who were terribly damaged and who could recover completely. So I agree with the concept that we can all do this. We only need the tools. So I've worked to develop the tools, and I was told to 
present this book as a manual for um, helping people to achieve the level of consciousness that they will need to ascend to a higher level. So it was designed to begin with childhood and to move through cultural issues and difficulties that we all experience. Um, much of it was, well, after I had written the book myself, I then was, <laughs> I then experienced a most remarkable um, turn of events. As I was trying to finish the book, I would type in a line and the last word would disappear. And this happened often when I was doing poems. So I'd write the line and the last disappear. And I'd go off for a break and I'd come back and there'd be editing marks and things underlined. And finally I just said, okay, who's messing with me? <laughs> you know? And I heard a voice say, it's me, Hemingway. <laughs> So I said, okay, I can use some work helping to shorten the sentences. <laughs> Let's go. So I then revised and rearranged the, um, the way the book is designed to flow. And I also was, I finally finished that, got it all done. And then I was told, okay, now go back and rewrite all the poems and make them rhyme. I said, oh no, that'll take months. I, I just want to be finished. I said, no, you have to make them rhyme. I said, well, Walt Whitman didn't make his poems rhyme. And they said, you're not Walt Whitman. <laughs> so ultimately, the design of the book and the way it is presented was channeled to me. Many of the chapter titles and some of the lines in the poems were given to me. So um, that's why I thought it would be important to present it to a group like this. Mm -hmm. I would really... You said you were understand. sent here um, to me. Um, was, that in, was that like a vision? Was that um, an instruction? Was it a hunch? Was it... Uh, I felt like an instruction. I, I have read almost all of your work and have your DVDs and I keep getting um, emails from Hay House about you know this event and that mm -hmm. conversation and up came this something about the cruise and in the wake of our ancestors and I went oh that's it <laughs> I have to go to that one so click there was no question in my mind I needed to be here. Mm. And how long have you worked mm. on this project? About 20 years. Mm. Full time? No, I've been practicing, you know, all along. Mm. I have my own private practice and running workshops and such things. But mm. I'm always working on it. Mm. So... As an idea to throw out to all of you, to react to, if you, if you hear it, is, um, and maybe you can just give a minute or two on uh, the difference between a, a head person and a heart person. You speak about um, René Descartes, who said, um, I think, therefore I am. And I've always said since the time I ever heard that when I was in high school, that he's got it mixed up. And yet we had whole courses on this. For me it was, I am, and that's enough. I am. And what I read last night was um, an interesting growth thing for me. I read of, um, a chapter that you wrote on Machiavelli and um, Ayn Rand. Now, Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand, um, most of you know, the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged and Anthem and uh, so many of her famous books. I've read all of them. And I was in the room with her. Um, she was at Madison Square Garden and uh, Phil Donahue was um, doing the show in Madison Square Garden. And 
and she sat in that. If you remember that show, it was, you probably find it on YouTube. And uh, I was, I had the same audience for this and the same venue the next day at Madison Square Garden on the Phil Donahue show. She was on Wednesday, I was on Thursday, and uh, I came this close to her but wasn't able to meet her. Um, and there was a time in my life when Anne Rand was um, like the most important, I thought the best, I mean, those books just blew me away. I mean, I read Atlas Shrugged, my, my daughter Serena read Atlas Shrugged. Uh, I, that, those long speeches by John Galt uh, were 70 pages long, I think. Of, uh, um, and there's a sense in, in which I feel that um, I wrote, uh, I wrote something uh, in The Shift called, uh, originally the, the title of the movie, The Shift, was called From Ambition to Meaning. And I think she stopped at ambition. And for me, um, I, uh, it's like Carl Jung once said that you don't solve your problems. You outgrow them. And I feel like I outgrew her. And it was almost sad to, to put it aside because I just revered what she had said so much uh, about the power and, and about the ego and about money and, and prestige and, and all of and, um, and now it just seems so off of where we are and where we need to go in our people. And you said something very beautifully in there that uh, that the slogan behind John Galt should have been. Do you remember what you said? I uh, I won't help anyone, and don't ask me. So maybe you can comment on the heart and the head, and I'd like to hear from you as well, because for me now that whole idea of uh, meaning only comes when we're able to serve. And. It's not about how much and what's in it for me. That's the mantra of the ego. The mantra of the higher self is, uh, how may I serve you? How may I re -up? That's the teaching of all of the great spiritual masters of all time. Yes. Um, I saw this in the people that I worked with. That one after another, people would come in and say, I'm just too much in my head. I thought, yes, aren't we all? And began tracing these ideas <clears throat> to their origins, uh, recent origin, origins. Um, I think Descartes set us on a path of about 600 years of misunderstanding what a human being is made of with the idea that you could be a rational mind separate from anything else and that that would be the highest level you could possibly reach. Well, as I was writing the book, I was tracing the darkness um, of these ideas and where they had come from and realized that the ultimate of being a rational person is to be a psychopath with no feeling, no heart, no soul, just thought. And if you can reach that state of being a head without a heart, you can believe anything. You can believe anything you want to think. You can believe anything people tell you. It's only with our connection to our hearts that we feel the truth. Only a heart can love, and only a heart can feel the truth. So without that, we're helpless. We're robots, you know, or malleable in other people's hands. So once we make contact with our hearts and truly understand that that's where our knowledge comes from, that's where our truth, the truth of who we are, the truth of why we're here, then our mind is like the computer that stores the knowledge we need so we can recite the poetry. 
You make a uh, comparison to uh, politics. Yes. And how we have uh, how we have politicians in the world today, not just in America, but, but particularly in America, um, who don't really care about our country, about each other, about serving. Is that part of this whole process of uh, you know, abuse being foisted on us? Yes. Once you are in your head and people are telling you, don't give anything away. You're a fool. Keep it for yourself. You learned it. You deserve it. Don't listen to these socialists. <laughs> <laughs> right. who tell you you should share and everybody should have the benefits and the abundance. That's not the highest path. You should strive to get as much as you can and keep it. Maybe give some to your kids, but not even that necessarily. So the, the whole process of investing in ideas and in self-reliance without the real actualization, which is to discover your heart and your communication with others. Um, without that, self-actualization is just selfishness and greed. I came to um, probably the highest place of self-actualization for myself. Um, in some of the lowest times in my life. Yes. You find that to be true? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, coming out of them is the best part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, when you start to believe your own feelings, I have a section in here about the two-week cure for depression. Depression is thinking about your own feelings and thinking about what you think about your own feelings. And what other people think about what you think about your feelings and so on and the cure for depression is go out and do something for someone else like what start small smile uh, tell a story to a child um, go out in the street and look around you know someone drops something pick it up run after them Anything the the opportunities will present it will be presented every moment of every day. So the heart is really the solution. Yes. For not just depression, but for worldwide depression as well. Exactly. I think we're caught. The in mic is over here. If anyone feels compelled to come up and share, I'd, I'd like to invite you to just uh, walk over, or Nancy, you just raise your hand a little bit, and Nancy will. I'd like to involve. Uh, others in here as well. But we're talking here in this satsang about um, moving from a, a head space to a heart space. If you read the shift, the book, The Shift, there are four chapters in The Shift. From ambition to meaning. And you don't get to a place of meaning in your life by doing it through your head. It is a sharing, God-realized, self-actualized, reaching out and recognizing what the Native American said, that no tree has branches so foolish as to fight among themselves, that we are all in this thing together. And that is the solution to virtually everything in your, that you call a problem. The Course in Miracles says you have no problems. You just think you do. It all comes from your thoughts. Yes. My name is Nikki. I come from Greece, from Athens, Greece. Wow, we're going home, huh? Yes. <laughs> I was home yesterday. Yeah. So I just wanted to say that uh, what Dr. Major said uh, was so compatible with what Viktor Frankl said that you talked about yesterday, Dr. Wayne. Right. Uh, if you're depressed, you have to do something for yourself and you store not for yourself, for others. And then you start building up your life again as meaningful to you. Uh, when uh, Dr. Frankl was, uh, he just uh, was released from the concentration camps, he felt that his life was meaningless. He didn't know what to do. 
So he just said, I will start living my life. He wanted, he was battling with suicide, suicidal thoughts. So he said, I will start living for others. And that's how he started writing all his books. And through living for others, he started living for himself. And he became self-actualized. Yeah. So it's absolutely compatible with that. Mm. Meaning can come in so many ways. We were flying here from London, uh, and there were two, were two rows, uh, and I was on the right-hand side, and and there was a woman who was um, a short woman. She was an Oriental woman, and she was trying to put her bag. Uh, and it was across the uh, across. Uh, there were like four people between myself and her. She was trying to put her bag up in the overhead compartment, and there was a man right behind her, um, and he was just watching her and smiling at her difficulty. He was a nice man. I'm sure he's a nice man, and he had a bag himself. But, and I said to Maya, who was sitting next to me, I said, I was trying to send him a signal. Reach down and help this woman you know, just, just reach out. It's like it's such a wonderful opportunity for you to find meaning in your life by doing something like that. I was just almost, I'm at the stage in my life now where I, when opportunities are like that and I don't get it, I feel almost a sense of resentment that I wasn't able to be there to be able to do that because there's such a wonderful, joyful feeling in reaching out and serving someone else rather than saying, I want to get what's in it for me and, and, and just keep it. Um, that's what meaning is. Meaning becomes, uh, and the irony is that since the, the shift in my life has been from ego because I had, you know, lots of things thrown at me in a very big way as a pretty young man in my 30s, you know, top of the bestseller list, making endless amounts of money, you know, just being invited to do all kinds of things, you know, being around movie stars, all of this kind of stuff from being a, a little orphan kid and being a school teacher, you know, to having all of this. And it was when it was when my wife left, and um, and I had to really go within and find that compassion at heart. That I began to be much more of of someone who gives away virtually everything that comes my way. And the irony, the great irony of this, and I don't know if you found this because I haven't gotten all the way through this because I I don't I just pick it up where it is. I can't tell you how much how impressed I am with what you've done. Um, is uh, is that the more I've done that, that the and I got the mic here, and you came here to hear me, so I can just tell you from what I my experience is that when I have made this shift from ambition, from John Galt, from Howard Rourke, from these characters who you know who are, who are contemptible of uh, of the poor and the weak and the, the people who can't make it and so on. And the earth. And, yeah, and the planet, right. Um, when I began to do that, so much more has flown into my life that I don't even know what to do with it. Um, when I get back to my home, there, there's so many checks that are waiting for me, so much money that is just waiting, money that at, at one time I, when I've done anything to be able to go after, and already when I do my meditation, okay, so now I'll be able to do this, and I'll be able to give it to them, and oh, this person over here needs that, and, and oh, my daughter, you know, one of my daughters is married to someone who's got some debts, and maybe I can, I can help that, and, and it's like, it's, and the more of that that I do, the irony is, um, the head doesn't matter anymore, and then you just start noticing. You start noticing that the more of that, that you, the better that you feel. And, and basically, it's what I said about love. The miser's love for gold isn't in the gold. It's in the outpouring of the love. It's like with Dana up here and giving, giving me the triangle from around her neck. It's like, it's... It's the fact that she wanted to just give that to me, this precious, precious thing that had been that had been blessed by this beautiful, saintly man. Um, and uh, anyway, yes, I want to hear from others. Hi, my name is Tony. I'm from California. Hi. I know I hugged you the other day because I said ever since I've been I around do. you, I've been crying. I've been crying, I remember, yes. And even before my trip, I had an appointment with... Um, my Reiki master, and she said how important this trip was and that it would be rewiring my brain and just a huge healing experience. Mm -hmm. And before you started today, I 
thought there was another woman that was Catherine, and I just sent her, there was a message in my head really clear that said, you need that book. Mm -hmm. And so I sent a little note to the woman who I thought was Catherine and said, I need to, you know, I would like to get a copy of your book, and I was wondering how I could do that. And, oh, and then I've also been someone that I've, Lately, synchronicities have taken place, and I feel like that I'm getting communicated most of the time. This will sound silly, but in forms of bumper stickers or license plate, within just a few days, I had two separate cars that both had license plates that read Truth Seeker. Mm. So I've just had okay. lots of things like that. Where so can people? Book. Yeah, we've got quite a few people in about 10 right, minutes. Or right. Not even that, maybe five or six. So, Cause, Go ahead. I have a website called whoneedslight.org. And what does that title mean? <laughs> does anyone here need light? <laughs> you make a distinction between darkness and light. That, uh, that the openings uh, uh, um, that we have when we're in ambition are dark. Darkness comes in when we're mm -hmm. in our head. And the openings that when we're in our heart space that comes in, what comes in is light. Uh -huh. That's a very important distinction. When you're in your head space, darkness comes in. Why is it darkness? Because the mantra of the ego is more. I'm not satisfied. I don't have enough. My crown, said Shakespeare, my crown is in my heart, not on my head, not decked with diamonds nor Indian stones, no to be seen. My crown is called content. A crown it is that seldom kings enjoy. Content. I'm content. You're never content when you're in ambition. You're always wanting more. When you're content, you can be in awe. There's no awe, is there? There's no astonishment in content. No. Yeah. Or in ambition or greed. So you have printed these yourself and... Yeah, for the time being, this is the first edition. Mm. Mm -hmm. I talked to you about having it edited, and what did you say? Oh. I I thought it was too long. Mm. Pretty <laughs> and long. And I kept I kept saying, shouldn't I leave out this, or does this really need to be included? And I kept getting put it in. In fact, expanded. So I thought I was finished, and I got a message saying. Now, you need to write another chapter. <laughs> well, so. here's what the New York Times said about your previous book. Powerful, and it's called Back Rooms. Powerful stories of desperation and courage. If a single book could shake the young, even the not-so-young, out of their complacency, it is this one. That's the New York Times book review. They don't say nice things like that very often. <laughs> the Chicago Tribune said this is a searing book. Provocative and highly readable. I hope this one will surpass that. <laughs> I can promise you <laughs> that what we're doing right now, it will already surpass it. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Steve. Hi, Steve. And uh, I keep reflecting on the name of this, the wake of our ancestors. And I keep walking around this damn ship and looking at the wake. <laughs> and I say to these bubbles, I said, why do you have such a hold on me? And things that we've learned when we were very little just continue to crop up and it, it was funny because it became such a hit for me when you started on politics and I'm like well, why don't you say that about the other side mm -hmm. and these are things that we learn when we're very little and we don't want them to catch us and we don't want them to you know we don't want them to find who we're going to be in the future and they have such a hold the wake mm -hmm. driving the ship yes that's a good point. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, getting out of the wake is, uh, you know, here's here's something that I learned from Bashar. This moment is not connected to that moment. So when anybody tells you, well, but you said this before, this moment is a new moment. Every moment is a new moment. So. That's, but that's in the fifth density, and that's in the fifth dimension when we leave these bodies. You'll see it when you go to sleep tonight. The moment.
moments are just dis everything is disconnected, isn't it? You can be this here, then you can be something else, and then over here, and it's like there's no. We can recreate our past. Yes. Hi, my name's Lisa. We can't put any more people in, so because we have to close in five minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, we'll do name. it. We'll be back in two days. Sorry, Lisa. That's all right. Did you just knock her over there? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Lisa. Um, I just wanted to tell you a story that happened to me that was, sorry, <laughs> that um, was probably one of the most phenomenal things that's ever happened to me. It was all to do with the heart. And one day I was um, trying to find a parking place and the man in front of me um, saw a parking place and uh, he lined up for it and, and then a parking place between us came available and, and I was going to turn into that. And he saw me behind him and he assumed I was going to take his parking place. And I went past him and he started abusing me and screaming at me and saying, why are you going to take my parking place? And I just walked, went, left the, went on. And I, I was taking some time to get out of the car. And as I left the parking place, this man came towards me and he started getting very angry, like, that's an understatement, he was really, he was abusive, I've never actually heard anyone more abusive in my life, it was, it was like if he had had a knife, he would have stabbed me, that's how angry he was, and I was trying to explain to him that I wasn't taking his parking place, and he didn't want to listen, and I moved on, and I thought, because I actually never had witnessed or felt such anger in my life, and I thought, okay, I have a choice here what to do with this. What, how, what do I do with this? How do I <laughs> handle this, what this man felt? And, and I said, okay, I have a choice. Okay, I don't, I don't accept this. I, I don't take this on and I, I send it back to you. And I, went, I was going to the appointment and I was going to see this doctor and I, was, um, I just needed to go to the toilet first. And then I was at the sink. And I was looking at my reflection, washing my hands and thinking, there's something more, there's something more to this. I was completely, it was like it hadn't happened, but there's just something I needed to do extra. And so I decided that I need to send this poor man love. And so I looked in my reflection and I just sent him love. I just closed my eyes and just sent this man, this poor abusive man who felt he needed to attack me verbally love. I went into the, I went into the, had my appointment with this doctor. I walked out of the lift. I walked out, got into the lift. Oh my God. And I experienced who I was, who I really was. This great big ball of white light and love. And I was huge. I was massive. And it just felt so awesome. And I was just standing in this lift going, Oh my God, this is who I am. Oh my God, this is just phenomenal. And, and everything, all thought, everything was gone. And I just, I uh, can't tell you how amazing it felt. And then I looked over to the lady who was in the lift next to me, and she was exactly like me. She was just this great big ball of love and light. And I was just looking at her going, Oh my God, can't you see who you are? Look at you, look at you. You're the same as me. We're this ball of light and we're so beautiful. And this poor, poor lady, because I'm standing there with absolute love in my eyes. Like she was the most beautiful person I'd ever set eyes on. She was about 80. She, <laughs> she to outward experience, outward looks wasn't she was she was um you, you wouldn't have expect someone like me to be just pouring out this love to her and i'm sitting there and i've got the other thing was that this doctor i'd seen had treated me for allergies and i wasn't allowed to touch any metal so i had these gloves plastic gloves on my hands so i'm sitting in the lift standing in the lift with these gloves looking at this lady with absolute love and she's just trying to get over into the corner of the lift as far away from me as she can possibly get because there's something obviously crazy with this woman. 
And we got to the ground floor and she ran out of the lift. And um, I walked out and this is, a, I'm from Sydney, this is one of the biggest streets, busiest streets in Sydney. And I walked out and I could see everybody was the same. There was just this cars going past and, and people walking and I could actually hear their thoughts. And I could hear them thinking everything. Like I could hear them saying, oh, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And, and oh, well, he didn't, he said this to me and blah, blah, blah. And I was just standing there and saying to each of these people, stop thinking, feel, feel, be in your heart, feel what you are. Just look what you are. And I was just wanting someone to, to look them in the eyes and just say, can you see what I am? And look at what you are. But everybody was in their heads. They were thinking and, and there, was no, there was no presence. They weren't present. And I, I could also see that the connection between us, there were these red um, ties connecting us all. And as I stood there, I knew that I needed nothing, absolutely nothing. I didn't need my family. I didn't need anything. I was just so big and so powerful and just all love. And this all came from, to... this came from, um, this, your, came, this came from your greatest teacher. This came from the man who, who gave me the most physical, verbal abuse or any abuse that I'd ever had. And there was something, now you're a therapist, you've worked with, with this kind of, this kind of people, this abusive people. What is your comment? What do you? Well, of course, that's exactly what they need. <laughs> um, but sometimes these people are not willing to mm. accept the love. So it's our job to offer it and to learn exactly what you learned. This is what it's called a quantum moment mm -hmm. in your life. It's a moment you never, you'll never forget. I'll never forget it. Yeah, and, and it turned. It, it really helped you to make a shift. We're going to have to close uh, in just a I minute. I just want to say one thing, and that was my belief is that because I sent him love, it came back to me in the right. fault. Mm -hmm. I know my friend Ramdas speaks about that. I've had him at seminars, and he'll just stand there and he'll look at a wall and he'll just say. I just love that wall. It's just, it's just so, it's like Mary Oliver said, you know, be astonished and pay attention. Be astonished and, and share it with other people. You can be astonished. Like, you can fall in love with the cashier, you know. You don't have to take her home and go to bed. You don't have to do all of that. You can just go, you know, you just walk through life falling in love, being in that love state. And uh, mm -hmm. that's when meaning, that's really what meaning is. And, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for those of you who didn't, yeah, for those of you who didn't get to speak, we'll have plenty of opportunity at, at our next episode. Say. So thank you, and thank you, Catherine. Thank you for thank you. 20 years of just incredible work and brilliant writing, and uh, and I'm really, uh, I'm really humbled to have you here. I really am. You've done such a such a beautiful job with this. I'm going to treasure this. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your big toe. This is for you. Thank you. <laughs> God bless you. We'll see you uh, in Istanbul, in Constantinople. <laughs> Thank you.